Right, okay, so thanks very much for coming tonight and um, welcome to Villa Park. I'll try and fly through this as quickly as possible. I know we've run over a little bit on time. Um, but basically what I'm going to talk about tonight is multi-mechanical models. So I'm going to start off by talking about what they are. Um, it's quite a novel approach to monitoring and reporting training loads. I'm going to talk about the research surrounding it, the very limited research surrounding it that's out there at the moment with regards to monitoring football. I'm going to talk about how we implement it at Villa Park as well. So. I'm going to show you to begin with how it fits into our training process and how we can use it to influence our practice. So we've obviously got our standard training process. This starts with our external load, so the demands of training or competition, so your physical exercises and tasks. This in turn leads to an internal load response, so whether that's physiological, biochemical um, or psychological, and this leads to a training outcome. Now us as practitioners, as sports scientists, it's our job to try and monitor these external internal loads. So with regards to external loads, you have all your technology that's coming out at the moment. Obviously this is a catapult meter, so GPS is going to be one of them. We have accelerometers, magnetometers, gyroscopes, we even have video analysis. Then we can come to internal load, we have heart rate, blood lactate, RPE seems to be one of the most common ones. On top of this as practitioners, we need to look at the individual characteristics that will affect these external internal load um, responses. So we have a physical status, the training history of that individual, the age, external stresses, things like that, their perceptual well-being. And overall, what we try and do is to create a physiological adaptation that we get a, an increase in fitness, tapering into competition to reduce fatigue, and that will create our optimal performance. So when it comes to our uh, mechanical models, it fits into this area here. So how we monitor workload, certainly the external workload of training. So as sports scientists and our jobs try and manage that training load and structure, our end game is the competition. That's what we should base all our training loads on. We need to develop a player to meet the physiological demands of what they're going to do on that pitch outside. So to do that, like I said, with GPS, we have these fancy bits of kits that we pay quite a lot of money for, um, with a lot of technology within to get a lot of information. Now the problem is these little bits of technology you put on your back, they give you a lot of information. So these are all the parameters that these devices will give you. Now, I'm not, I need to speed things along, but this is going to last about 45 seconds. So there are thousands upon thousands of metrics. On my laptop alone, there was 1,400, but I think I've heard that's quite a, a small number in comparison to some other people. So that's still going. Again, all this information we're getting on what they're doing physically on a pitch. But when we come to actually reporting this data, I'll speed that along. We typically take a player and we only use typically 10 or 15 metrics. Uh, these are the ones that generally pop up time and again when you see physical reports of training or competition. We have total distance, we have sprint distance, we have high speed running, axles, D-cells, maybe player load, certainly percentage of max speed, but we never take it any further than that. Now the issue is when we're reporting this information in that, in that setting, we're always reporting it in isolation. So if we're reporting total distance, it's always in isolation. It's never in, in linked up to the other parameters that we're doing as well. So let's take total distance for instance. If you're structuring a week leading into competition, say they're doing 12K in a game, you want to do maybe 3K on a Monday, uh, on a Tuesday you'll do maybe a harder day, 5K, 6K on a Wednesday and build it up and do it in that way. Now looking around this room, everyone could do that total distance in a week, but it wouldn't necessarily, necessarily prepare you for the competition. But we still do this for every parameter, even high speed running, we try and structure it throughout the week. Say if you're doing um, a model where you want to cover two times your high speed run in a week leading into competition, you'll structure it throughout the week of what you want to do. But again, everyone in the room could do that, but it wouldn't prepare you for the competition because you've got other things that you're doing as well. So what a multi-mechanical model is, is trying to bring all these parameters together to give a set score that gives you a relative volume and intensity score of what they're going to experience in a game. So rather than looking at all these different metrics, you just get one complete score, which helps report it to a coach and it gives you more clarity on what you're doing. So what does current research say on multi-mechanical models? The first study came out in late 2017 by Adam Owen and the rest. Um, basically, they looked at professional football in Switzerland. They looked over a 20-week period and they created a volume and intensity equation to try and quantify training loads. So rather than reporting individual metrics, they tried to create one single metric. They found, or they thought that there was four key print, uh, metrics that you need to focus on. Total distance, high speed running, sprint distance, and then the sum of axles and D-cells. 
What they did with these variables after that, they took the maximum match exposure that these players had done and divided that training by that. So say you've done 7K in a training session, they'll divide it by the maximum total distance that a player's done uh, in a game, so divided by 12. They'll add all these parameters together, divide it by four times 100, and that gives you a volume uh, percentage. Now that's all well and good, you might do the volume of a game, but the training session might last five hours. So to compensate for that, um, and to look at the relative intensity, the intensity would obviously be quite low in that situation. Uh, they did it by per minute to give an intensity equation. Say for instance, if you do the volume of a game in half an hour, the intensity will be high. So that's how they tried to simplify training. So if you look at the individual metrics, as you'd expect, certain days exposed players to different um, cycles of metrics throughout the week. But when you looked at volume intensity, again, you got that same representation of, depending on the day, you got different scores with regards to volume and different scores with regards to intensity. Quite straightforward stuff, really. Ever since, so basically what they found at the end, sorry, um, that you've got this, this method, this tool, where you can report practice or you can report training to the coaches in a simplified manner. Um, and you can use it as part of your player monitoring strategy to taper the week leading into competition. Ever since then, there's been no other research that I've found. I could be wrong, my literature review might have been very poor, but I can't seem to find any other literature, please tell me if I'm missing one, on multi-mechanical models. So you've got this, this equation, this method of quantifying training that's simplified, that's understandable by a coach, but there's no other research to, to follow it up. I know it's only late 2017, it's quite recent, but still you think there'd be more following in the footsteps of this initial research. So this is something we've actually done at Aston Villa for a couple of seasons now. Um, we did this before the study came out, in fact, and we took it, I'm not going to lie, we took it from work Chris Barnes did with West Brom, so it might have stemmed from there originally. Um, but we perform these uh, volume intensity equations and we look at five key metrics. Now these key metrics, we always look at the ones that are going to be um, influencing our performance and that have the biggest risk for injury. So we start with total distance. Now this is data going back from last season. Uh, we see total distance as a performance metric for us because during the games that we won, we covered more distance than when we drew and when we lost. It's that simple for us. Also from an injury perspective, research by Gabbert and Ola um, found that relative distance is one of the higher potential risk factors for soft tissue injury. Um, so again, you've ticked two boxes there. You've got performance metric and an injury metric. So we include that within our equation. So if high intensity distance, um, again, a risk factor for soft tissue injury, and even more so with performance, we cover more high intensity distance during games that we win, as opposed to when we draw and lose. Then you have accelerations and decelerations. Uh, we know these are going to expose players to a lot of mechanical stress, um, and they are linked to injury rates as well, so we start to incorporate accelerations and decelerations. And then we have player load, which is obviously a catapult metric. There's not a great deal of research showing its validity yet, but there is something coming through, and obviously it uses the accelerometer within the device to look at forward, sideways, and vertical acceleration. So there's tiny, smaller movements. So these are our equations. They look very complicated, but they're not, I assure you. We get the distances of covered in training for these four, uh, five metrics, so total distance, high-speed running, accelerations, decelerations, and player load. We divide them by the average of what the player covers in a game, not the max. Um, I think the max doesn't represent fully what they're going to do uh, on, a, on a game day because you might find things differently, but say if a player gets their max high speed running in a game, their total distance usually isn't their max as well. You never really find a game where they're all getting maximum on all of them, so we take their average. We add them all together, divide them by 5 times 100, you get a percentage of volume. For the intensity equation, obviously we make it relative for the duration of that session as well. So an example of how these equations work, Say we've got Conor Hurahan there in a training session, this is all hypothetical, he covers 6.5k, 500 meters high speed running, 16 axles, cells, 19 D cells and about 600 player load. Now for the most part people go to a, a, your coach or your manager or player after training and say you covered 6.5k today, six, 500 meters high speed running, axle D cells, it doesn't tell you anything. So what we do, we take his average for the match data, divide it by what he's done in the training session using the equation and then rather than just saying these individual metrics, you can go to a player and say okay, with regards to our key metrics, you've done 50% volume of a game. In regards to intensity, you've done 72% intensity of a game. I know it's, you've got to take it with a pinch of salt, but it creates more of a, a language that a player and a coach is going to understand. 
So this is how we implement it within the practice of Aston Villa. These are our training reports that we create for the coaches on a daily basis. Um, so along with the key metrics at the top for each individual session, we have the total distance, high speed running, uh, sprint and change direction scores, but we also have that volume intensity uh, score as well. So for instance, this was last week, this particular session, match day minus five, 64% volume, 72% intensity of the game. More importantly for us though, is doing the same equation for each individual drill. So this is one of the drills from that session. It's a simple 8v8. Um, obviously you've got your basic metrics underneath, but in that top right hand corner, you can say that with this drill, 8v8, box to box, no stipulations or rules, you're doing 104% of match intensity. So you can say to the coach, look, this is the intensity of this drill. It replicates match intensity. Obviously that's a good thing for us. Um, you can then compare it to other drills that you do as well. So say if you do this drill a second time, was it the same intensity as before? Um, and then you've got the volume score as well. Over time, what you do is you build up these databases, um, you build up these drills, and then you can, rather than being reactive to training, you can be proactive in planning training to try and make sure that, say, if you're focused to create an intense session with reduced volume, you know which drills to pick uh, to get that intensity high without exposing to too much volume. So this is how our week plans out with these equations at the moment. If you look at volume, obviously the match day is the highest volume of the week and we'll get up to maximum 70% volume of a game on a match day minus four. Um, but more importantly for us, obviously our ideal tapering strategy is to maintain intensity and reduce volume going into a game. So as you can see, the intensity scores of each individual day is a lot higher than the volume, which fits in with that, the way we try to work. Um, so obviously the, match the intensity on three of the match days is around 80% or above. Um, and then furthermore, with using this equation to influence practice, uh, we have our return to play reports as well. So this is an example of an indi individual report of what they're doing in training. So you see on the right, this is a breakdown of what they've done in that particular session and how it compares to their match day minus four average as well. So you have your individual variables, but you also see just near the bottom, you have your volume and intensity score. So you can say as a practitioner or as a physio or a strength conditioning coach, okay, this player has done a session where they've been exposed to the same volume and the same intensity of what they're going to experience in training. We're happy for them to return back into that process or back in with the rest of the team. Um, you might find, for instance, that, okay, this player has ticked all the boxes. They've got the right volume of what they're doing in a game or what they're going to do in this training session but that intensity is not there. We need to do another session to get that intensity up before we feel happy to get them back into training. Also as well, you can look individually. So this is that same player building up. The red line is representative of the volume of a game using these five metrics. You can build up that training to try and get to those levels. That's probably quite a big step on that graph. Um, but it gives you more confidence that you're getting a player exposed to the volumes that they're going to be subjected to on a game day um, returning to play. And again, same with the intensity scores as well. Red line representative, 100% of the intensity of a game. And we're going to build them up to try and get them as close to that level as possible before they're integrated back into to playing on a weekend. Uh, a weekend. So I've sped through that 110 miles an hour because I know the time is getting on. But I suppose the key messages I want you to take home are training loads. For the most part, I don't know what everyone's doing, but for the most part, we generally report to the coach or player in isolated metrics. We, take, we look at total distance alone, look at high speed distance alone, axle D cells alone, and we focus on that, but it doesn't paint the picture of what they're doing on a pitch. So what multi-mechanical models do, they try and bring these together to give a score that we can give to a coach that they're gonna understand. Um, also as well, this is new and emerging field, so there's little research surrounding these type of models. So I suppose what it does for us as practitioners, there is one study out there at the moment on multi-mechanical models, I'm a big believer in it, I've used it for the last couple of years and it's helped me get that relationship with coaches and certainly with players and explaining to them what they've done in training. But there's nothing out there, so we have a clean slate as it were to do what we want, experiment, there's no right or wrong. Um, you might think that those metrics aren't necessarily important to the way you, you work, so you might want to change that, you want, might want to increase the weighting of axles cells and D cells because you find that as more of an important metric in the equation. Um, I suppose we are, at the end of the day, sports scientists, but if we actually look at ourselves, is the work we're doing actually experimental? Are we playing around with things? Are we tinkering about to try and change practice? Um, when we come to multi-mechanical models, there's not a lot of research out there. That, that we have scope to do that without any um, backlash. So I suppose pick out what you feel is important 
and uh, and just just play around really. And that is it. That is it. I'll sped through that as quickly as possible. Um, if you have any questions, please uh, just pop your hand up.